Hello and welcome to Lesson 3 of Denominational Doctrines. You know, you might have watched the first two lessons and you might be thinking, hey, I'd like some additional reading. I wish I knew of some good books that I could study. Well, I want to recommend just a few to you. Owen Albright has a couple of little books, Studies in Denominational Doctrine. I have found these to be very helpful. And you might want to get these. Notice they're not too thick, and he does a good job documenting what the various religious groups believe. So I believe those will be very profitable to you. Also, Rod Rutherford has a great book on denominational doctrine, and he covers the major religious groups, and I believe you'll find this very helpful as well. Then James Meadows. He has a study of different uh, religions and religious eras. And this is a good book. Then books that have been used for quite a while dealing with various uh, religious groups. Modern Churches in the Church by J. Porter Wilhite. That's a good little book. It covers nearly all of the religious groups. And one good thing about it, you can just look right here in the table of contents, find out which group you want to study, and then just turn over there and study that. Now sometimes, though, you're dealing with a specific group. Let's say Jehovah's Witnesses. Roy J. Hearn has written a great book, Handbook on Materialism. That if you can get the book, I highly recommend it. I know in my studies with Jehovah's Witnesses, I really try to read this book before I go and try to deal with their doctrine. And it's a great book. Then Ted Klein's got a little old book, Questions for Jehovah's Witnesses and Other Select Sermons. It's a good little book as well. Now these are just a few. There are many good books out there that you can buy that will help you in this study. Now in a moment, as we continue our study and as we continue through the coming lessons, you're going to see our approach might be a little different than what you might have thought. See, we're not going to take the Baptist and try to find everything that they believe that is wrong, or the Methodist, or the Presbyterians, or the Catholics. We're going to deal with individual doctrines. And the reason we're going to do that, we've found over 20 years of doing live radio and television, we hardly ever get into a discussion of when the churches were established by men, these various churches. Our discussion centers around doctrines. Is faith only right or wrong? Once saved, always saved. Is it right or wrong? And so forth. And so this shall be our approach, and we hope that it will be very helpful to you. But right now, we want to continue in looking at some of the things that uh, we have been pondering by way of introduction. You know, uh, a lot of people don't like to be investigated. And they try every way in the world to keep you and me from investigating them. And they come up with false doctrine even about things like judging. They don't believe it's a proper thing to do to judge. I have people call in and want to know, well, who made you the almighty one that gets to judge what's right and what's wrong? Well, I'm not the almighty one, but my heavenly father told me and Christ told me that I am to try the spirits to see whether they be of God. Now, some people will use like uh, John 7, 24 and uh, other verses and try to pervert those statements. But now let's look at John 7, 24. Judge not according to the appearance. Now, that's what a lot of people wants to do. And that's the way they get involved in false judging. But the Bible says, but judge righteous judgment. Garland Elkins said one time, a young fellow came to him and said, Brother Elkins, we've got to quote a verse. And uh, I don't know of any good verse to quote. Do you know one I could quote in class? And Brother Elkins said, well, why don't you quote John 7, 24? So the little fellow went to school, and when it was his turn to quote his verse, he simply quoted, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And the teacher said to little Johnny, don't you ever quote something like that and leave the impression it's found in God's word. Well, see, she didn't know that it was all right 
to make righteous judgments. She was under the impression that all judging was wrong because that's what we have been told. You know, that all judging is wrong. And the way that comes about, a lot of times people misuse Matthew 7. In Matthew 7, beginning with verse number 1, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine own eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Now, how can you go to these verses and be honest and fair with them and try to show that they're condemning judging. They're not condemning judging. They're condemning hypocritical judging. See, it's wrong for me to get on to you for drinking when I myself drink or do something equally wrong. And to show you that's the case, Matthew 7, 5 uh, says this, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Clean up your own life. Get that beam out of your own eye. Then you can help your brother. And so the Lord is condemning hypocritical judging. Now keep in mind, people go to Matthew chapter 7 and they say, well, all judging is wrong. Well, let's look at the context there for just a moment. And let's try to read the context with that in mind that all judging is wrong. And I want to show you that's an impossibility. As we look at verse 6, the Bible says, Give not that which is holy unto dogs. You can't practice that without making a judgment. How are you going to decide what's holy and what's not holy? without making a judgment. Who are the dogs? you got to make a judgment. You see, judging is involved. And the Bible says, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. What constitutes the pearls? Well, people say, well, that's the word of God, Wesley. Don't be stupid. Okay, are you talking about the Book of Mormon, the Koran? Are you talking about the Bible as we understand it. What are you talking about? You've got to make a judgment. And that judgment's got to be based upon evidence. Draw only those conclusions which are warranted by the evidence. So you see, we can't even practice Matthew chapter 7 without making judgments. You know, it goes on here to say, Asked, and it shall be given you. And here we have a whole section about prayer. Okay, ask for what? I had a, a Mormon friend say, Wesley, will you pray to see if the Book of Mormon's inspired? I said, no, I won't. You won't even pray about it? No. He said, why won't you pray about it? I said, because my Heavenly Father's told me the truth about that. If John Doe walks up to me and declares himself to be the Christ, it says, Wesley, would you pray to see if I'm the Christ? No. Why? Because the internal and external evidence of the evidences of the Bible proves the Bible to be true. And all then that it says is true, which makes Jesus the Christ. So I don't have to pray about John Doe to see whether or not he's the Christ or not. See, I've got to make judgments on these things. Shall I pray to Mary? There are those who will pray to Mary. See, I've got to make a judgment on that. Well, I pray to some saint. I've got to make a judgment on that. I can't even maintain a good prayer life without making judgment. Now, as we think about making these judgments, for what am I going to pray? For whom am I going to pray? Must I always pray in harmony with the Father's will? You see, these judgments must be made. So I can't practice Matthew chapter 7 without making judgments. It goes on to say, verse 12, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, 
Do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets? Now, I'm supposed to do unto others as I'd have them do unto me, but how am I supposed to know how to do unto them if I don't have a guide or a standard that knows and shows me what is in their best interest? See, I've got to make a judgment. And then it says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. Now I've got to determine which gate, which road, which way. Someone comes up to me, and they're religious. And they say, we're headed down the narrow way, headed for the straight gate. i got to make a judgment on that. Are they or are they not? You see, I can't go through life without making judgments. And then the Bible says, beware of false prophets here in verse number 15 of Matthew 7. Now the Lord tells me to beware of false prophets and then... I have religious people tell me I can't even make a judgment on that. Well, folks, I'm just going to have to believe the Lord. I can't believe these religious people. And one reason they don't want me making any judgments relative to what they're teaching is because they do not want to be investigated. Friends, we want you to investigate us. We want you to investigate what we're teaching. Why? Because your soul's too precious. Don't be misled by someone who does not want you to investigate them. Then the Bible says that I can know them by their fruits. I've got to now be a fruit inspector and see if they're bringing forth the kind of fruits that God Almighty wants brought forth. Is that a proper move? Is that a proper activity on my part? You better believe it. And the Word of God so states... And then the Bible tells me in verse number 21 that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now I've got to try to make a judgment on what the Father's will is so that I can either do it or not do it. And then the rest of the chapter goes on to talk about the wise man builds upon the sayings of God. Now I've got to determine what the sayings of God are, and I've got to make a judgment on whether or not I'm going to do them. And the foolish man will not build upon the sayings of God. You know, after Jesus got through speaking, they were astonished at his doctrine and said that he taught as one having authority. He didn't teach like the scribes and the Pharisees. You see, they made a judgment on it. I've got to make a judgment on what I think about Jesus, what I think about his teachings. You take the Jews over in Palestine right now, most of them have made a judgment about Jesus that they don't believe he's the Christ. See, we've got to do something with this man named Jesus. A judgment's got to be made on him, his life, his teachings. Is he the Christ? Is he the one who has all authority? Must I obey him or be lost? And then someone come along and say it's wrong to make judgments. Friends, you can't cross a road without making a judgment. And by the way, you ever notice the kind of judgments they don't want? They really don't believe judging is wrong as long as you'll commend them. Here's a fellow teaching whatever, and you say, well, he's a good man. Oh, they love that, yes. He mentioned Jesus. And he teaches Doctrine X. Oh, that's a great doctrine. As long as you'll say that, that's all right. When a preacher stands over a casket and tells what a good person this was and what a glorious hope they've got, and maybe they lived ungodly, the people in the audience don't seem to have a problem with that. But if you ever mention anything negative, then they have a problem. Now, as you and I make judgments, we want to make sure that we do this in a fair way and we judge not according to the appearance but we judge according to that which is righteous. And the only way we can do that is use the Word of God. So then the Bible tells me I've got to make judgments. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. The church couldn't even practice church discipline without making a judgment. Here's a fellow that's fornicating. Well, it's 1 Corinthians 5. Now, what shall we say about that? 
Shall we just conclude? Well, I can't say a whole lot about that because God told me not to judge. No, God didn't tell me not to judge. God told me to judge righteous judgments and even told me to make a judgment on that situation. That that is ungodliness and if the man will not repent, then I'm under a God-given obligation as a member of the body of Christ to stand against him. Are all world religions right in the sight of God? Now think about that. You know, we have people who call, say we're on faith only, on our radio program. And we're pointing out faith only is wrong. It's not authorized by the word of God. All right? Someone who believes that will often call and say, Wesley, you know what burns me up about you and some of the other speakers? And I say, well, what's that? The way you judge people. It's wrong to judge. And I'll say to them, sir, is that a judgment you're making? Are you not judging me? Oh, I'm telling you what the Word of God says, Wesley. It's wrong to judge. I said, look, you might not understand it to be so, but all I'm trying to do is tell you what the Word of God says when it says that a man is not justified by faith alone. I'm simply trying to do that. Now, how come you can judge me and say I'm wrong in making a judgment, but I can't judge a doctrine and declare it to be wrong when I know the Bible declares it to be wrong? I said, can I ask you something, sir? The Hindu religion. Is that okay? Why well, no, Wesley, everybody knows it's wrong. What about uh, Buddhism? Oh, that's wrong. How about the Islamic faith? Oh, that's wrong. Shintoism. It's wrong. Taoism. It's wrong. I said, sir, you just eliminated about three to four billion people. Sounds to me like you're becoming awful exclusive. Now, how come you get to say those things are wrong and I can't make a judgment and say something is wrong? How do you get to do that? And then they'll say, well, the way I do that is because these things violate the Word of God. I said, all right, let's move on just a minute. Let's, let's bring this thing on down into, quote, the realm of Christianity. Are the Mormons okay? No, they're wrong. Okay, what about uh, Jehovah's Witnesses? They're wrong. And then I say, sir, wait a minute. How come you declare the Mormons to be wrong? How come you declare the Jehovah's Witnesses to be wrong? You're judging them. You won't let me judge what you believe, but you're judging them. Now, how come you declare them to be wrong? And then he'll make a statement something like this. Because what they teach violates the word of God. And then I say this. If we're going to judge the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses by the word of God, let's judge all religious groups by the word of God, including what you believe, sir, and what I believe. Now, what's wrong with that? See, there's nothing wrong with that. Some people get upset because they don't like what they believe being critiqued. Now, let me tell you something. We're studying denominational doctrine. And one of the biggest obstacles you're going to run into out there doing personal work and teaching on radio, television, and in people's homes is going to be the fact that people are going to come down on you hard because you are judging them and who do you think you are? Oh, I've heard that over and over again. Now listen, you may or may not agree with the verdict handed down in the O.J. Simpson case. But I know this, it's right for me to quote the verdict. The verdict that the jurors made and the judge when the judge pronounced what the jurors had decided. Now, is it okay if I quote the judge in religious matters? Sure it is. You see, I'm not the judge, but I have a right to quote the judge. If not, why not? The judge said, for instance, in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, in the works of the flesh, a drunkard will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, here's a drunkard. 
Is it okay for me to love him enough to say, sir, you cannot continue to be a drunkard and be right in the sight of God? You see, that's love. That's not trying to be mean to the man. I love his soul. And yet some believe that you and I are very unkind if we make judgments of that nature. So all we're saying is let's go by what the Word of God says. Let's do Bible things Bible ways. And if we'll do Bible things Bible ways, then we can be pleasing to God. So how can we go about even obeying the Great Commission, folks, without making a judgment? Now, where I preach, they want me, as well as themselves, to go forth and proclaim the gospel to other, uh, other people and even preachers that are in error. But i got to make a judgment on that. What if I spent all my time going to faithful members of the church trying to convert them? You see, i got to make a judgment. And I go from house to house and I talk to these people. And when someone tells me they believe something that's not in the Bible, I have to make a judgment on that. And they have to make a judgment on me, and I, I'm not offended at that. When they say, Wesley, what must I do to become a child of God? And I tell them, they've got to make a judgment on that. It's either right or it's wrong. And so you and I should not become offended. If someone wishes to critique what we believe, as a matter of fact, we encourage them to investigate what we believe. But we have a right to investigate what they believe as well. Well, let's look at the sin of false, uh, the false doctrine of denominationalism. We want to see how gross a sin this really is. We want to notice it's a sin against God. When one promotes denominationalism, he's sinning against God. He may not realize that. Now, let me show you how. It makes God the author of confusion. Now here you got all these different religious groups, all of them claiming to be from God, all of them claiming to be going by the very standard which he authorized. Well, if that's right, then God is the author of confusion. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Now we know God's not the author of confusion, so when you see all these different religious groups, we have to ask the question, from whence did they come? If they did not come from God, there's only one other source, Satan and man. And so you and I don't want to be affiliated with that kind of sin and wrongdoing. B, we want to notice it's a sin against the Christ himself. You know, when you think about the life of Christ and what he tried to do, here's a man who prayed for unity. Notice in John 17, verse 20, beginning, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thy Father art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe thou hast sent me. Why pray for unity? That the world may believe thou hast sent me. I was told of a place one time where various religious groups went and they were trying to get into a place in Africa and they all took their different doctrines and they were all crossed up something fierce. And the chief said, listen, you fellows go back to America. Find out what you believe. Then come back and try to talk to us. Well, that's good advice. Why bring all those conflicting views in there and have all that wrangling when it's not authorized by God? So Jesus Christ prayed for unity. Why? That the world may believe. Now, when you look at uh, atheism in America, you see how an atheist can be laughing at religious people. You got this fellow over here that believes faith only saves. This fellow says, no, faith only does not save. You got this fellow over here saying, hey, you can't do anything to be saved. You got this fellow over here saying, grace alone saves. And all of them saying, hey, Mr. Atheist, we go by the word of God. Well, he doesn't believe that. And neither do I. All those people cannot be going by the word of God. Notice Jesus prayed for unity. Then notice he practiced unity. In John 10, 30, he says, I and my Father are one. 
Jesus Christ believed in unity. Then notice he preached unity. In Matthew 12, 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. He says, look, you can't be divided and expect to stand. He says, you're simply going to destroy yourself. And you mean to tell me then the Lord didn't have any better sense than to establish all these various religious groups, each one fighting against the other, trying to, in many cases, devastate the other. And when we look at the signature at the bottom of the page, you mean to tell me the Lord signed that as if though that's his doings? No, he didn't do that. And then I want you to notice our Lord, he planned unity. When you go to Ephesians 2 and you start with verse number 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. Now watch this, who hath made both one Jew Gentile. He made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Think about this. When the Lord chose to establish his church, he broke down the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. He did not want a church for the Jews and one for the Gentiles. He wanted them together in one place, that's in his body, all united believing the same thing. Now, he died that that could be a reality. You mean to tell me that after he did all he could to bring Jew and Gentile together, that now he has authorized all these various denominational churches that promote division, that it's okay to be a Baptist, a Methodist, a Presbyterian, a Catholic, a Jehovah's Witness, a Mormon, and on and on we could go, each of whom are fighting against each other and will not even work together to try to promote the cause of Christ? And you mean to tell me this is God sent, Christ endorsed? You know better than that. Oh, God's given you a great mind. Use it. But most importantly, use the standard he's given you with that great mind. You see, God wants you to think correctly. He wants me to think correctly. Well, notice then in the next point that it's a sin against the Holy Spirit. Oh, you have people saying, oh, the Holy Spirit's led me to do this, and the Holy Spirit's led me to do that. You know, I do what I do because the Holy Spirit told me. A lady called the program one time and said, the Holy Spirit told me to preach. I said, well, that's funny. The Holy Spirit told me you couldn't. When did he change his mind? He says a woman's not to teach nor usurp authority over the man. Now, when in the world did the Holy Spirit change his mind on that? You see, we as members of the Lord's Church, we believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. But how? Through the Word of God. See, if I want to know what the Holy Spirit believes on any given subject, I go to the Bible. I know these people were led by the Holy Spirit. I know that what they say is Holy Spirit given, Holy Spirit protected, so that what they wrote could not be wrong. Now notice, when one says the Holy Spirit led this group to believe one thing and this group over here to believe something else and this group over here to believe something else, it leaves the impression the Holy Spirit's endorsing error. Now the Holy Spirit leads all right, but how does he do it? How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Now the apostles, not Wesley Simons, the apostles were guided into all truth. That truth is recorded in this book. So when I read what the book says, I'm reading the view of the Holy Spirit on that subject. Well, notice denominationalism is also a sin against the Bible. You wouldn't believe how people attack the Word of God because of the sin of denominationalism. On our radio program, the Bible is constantly under attack by those out in the denominational world. And one reason they've got to do that is because it doesn't agree with them. You know, most religious people use their feelings as a standard rather than the Bible. And so then this becomes a major problem. 
Oh, I've had them tell me I'd rather have what I feel right here is all the Bibles you can put in this room, Wesley. I wouldn't exchange my feelings for the Word of God any time. You know what they just did? They made themselves the standard, threw the Bible away. Now, they don't want to do that in a sense, but in reality, that's what they're doing. The Bible says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Denominationalism is also a sin against prophecy. So how in the world is it a sin against prophecy? Well, let me show you. The Lord in John 10, 16 said, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I will bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Notice, Jesus said, I've got other sheep not of this flock. I've got others that are going to come other than the Israelites. And I'm going to bring them together. And there's going to be one fold. And there's going to be one shepherd. The Lord prophesied unity. And then when someone endorses denominationalism, whether he wants to or not, he, in essence, is going against the prophecy that our Lord made. Then I want you to notice that denominationalism is a sin against society. Denominationalism confuses people. They do not know what they need to do in order to be saved and so forth. We've had callers call in and they'd say, well, I don't see the problem. Why I can't be a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian and you be what you want to be? I said, well, let me show you the problem. I said, suppose I'm at your home and someone knocks on the door. It's a friend of yours. They're troubled. They want to know what must I do to be saved. You're going to tell them one thing. I'm going to tell them something else. You mean to tell me that's not confusing? Sure it's confusing. It's not only confusing, it is wrong. And then notice, denominationalism is a sin against the family. Oh, friends, I could tell you a lot of stories right here that would break your heart. You know, you got uh, a husband who maybe is a, a Baptist. You got a wife that's maybe a Jehovah's Witness. And they can't even go to services together. You mean to tell me God designed this system? That here you got a husband that's a Baptist, a wife that's a Jehovah's Witness. What are you going to teach your children? Are you going to teach them to be Baptist? Or are you going to teach them to be Jehovah's Witnesses? I know of cases where they've decided this. All right, the husband believes one thing, the wife another. Let's let the children choose a third religion. I've gone into people's homes where the home was divided religiously. And I've watched either the husband or the wife cry as they talked about the division that had been brought into their home because of denominationalism. Now, friends, you mean to tell me this is God's design? That God wants a husband and a wife against each other? I know places where when families get together, they can talk about politics. They can talk about sports. They can talk about what's going on at their jobs. But they can't talk about religion. You know why? Because here, like I mentioned a moment ago, the father might be a Baptist, the mother a Jehovah's Witness, now little Junior's a Methodist, and over here little Sally, she's a Presbyterian, and right on down the line, and they just cannot talk about the Bible without getting angry and upset with each other. Now let me ask you, do you think that's from God or from Satan? Well, you know who it's from, and so do I. God Almighty did not come up with that system. Satan came up with that system. Now when you read the Bible, the Bible teaches that we're to train up a child in the way it should go. Which way? God only has one way. The Bible says that we fathers are to bring our children up in the teaching and the admonition of the Lord. Same way with the mothers. Now, how in the world can I, as a father, try to teach my child what he or she needs to do and when the wife doesn't even believe that? 
She understands that to be wrong. Now, common sense and the Word of God will show you that that can't be right. You know it can't be right. So then what we're trying to do is call you back beyond all these denominational groups, back to the Bible. When people call in on the program, I ask them this. Is the Lord's church here upon the face of the earth anywhere separate and apart from denominational era? Well, yeah, I guess it is. Then I ask them, then where is it? Is it in the group known as the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons? Where is it? You see, the bottom line is, the only way we can tell is by the lie detector. If you and I will take the Bible, be honest, loving, and caring, and investigate, we can find out what God wants us to do. I preach where my two daughters attend. And I tell them, don't you take daddy's word for anything. When dad gets up there and preaches, it's your God-given obligation to check him out. And if dad ever preaches anything that's false, it's your God-given obligation to love him enough to stand against him. Now friends, why would that be offensive to anyone? If I know my heart, I want to go to heaven. I believe you do too. If you want to go to heaven, then you're under a God-given ob obligation to investigate. Make sure what you believe is right. Now, once you establish that there is one church, and you know the plan of salvation, you know the way God wants you to worship, you know the way the church is set up and so forth, you now have an obligation to share it with those you love. Oh, if it's great for you, it ought to be great for them. If it's going to help take you to heaven and through the Lord's church is the only way to go and through Christ is the only way to go, then that's going to be true for your kin folks as well. So in this study, it's going to be wonderful to open the Bible, to examine what men have said, and see what the Word of God says relative to that. And to see the clear distinction between truth and error. And truth never looks better than when it's contrasted with error. Truth is always consistent. So we want you to join us as we continue to study denominational doctrine. And may God richly bless you as you continue to study the greatest of all books, the inspired, inerrant, perfect will of God.